Okay. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining our Catch webinar series, Next Generation Data Privacy. Today, you'll be hearing from two of our privacy experts, Jonathan Joseph, who is Catch's Head of Customer Solutions, and Robert Cunningham, who is Catch's Head of Legal Privacy. Today, they'll be walking us through how to solve the data dilemma so many organizations are facing in light of ever-changing privacy regulations. Gentlemen, take it away. All right. Hey, thanks, Lindsay. And thanks, everyone, for joining us. Uh, we're excited to share how we're solving some, some pretty big challenges in the data privacy world that help you take the complexity out of it and uh, get and stay compliant, save money on compliance costs, which, which can be huge, and make money. Ensure that data, that which is the lifeblood of your business, is, is put, to, put to use throughout it. And if you've never seen a lawyer run a demo, you're about to, uh, and it's a real treat. Thank you, Robert, for joining us. You're welcome, Jonathan. Boy, is it ever. <laughs> and look at those ties. I don't know where they got these photos from, but I, but I love those ties. I haven't worn one of those uh, in in about ten years. I, I didn't re I didn't know what that was. You've probably never worn one, Jonathan. That's probably true. That's probably true. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's get started. So where, where do we start? Privacy is such a disruptive force on on businesses, causing a rethink of business practices. You know, we're dealing with evolving consumer expectations. We need to plan for new cost expectations, but we need to continue to build revenue growth. What makes it challenging, I think, relative to, to other disruptive forces that businesses have had to deal with is that complexity is just so pervasive, I think, in the, in the data privacy world. So let's start with the regulations as an example. Uh, you know, Gartner says that 75% of the world will be covered by modern privacy regulations by 2023. In the US, we, we have the California law, of course, and its amendment, CPRA, coming soon. And I'm trying hard to, to avoid acronyms, even though there's a crazy amount of those on this page. Virginia just passed its law, and there are a host of states considering legislation as well as a proposal for federal laws. GDPR has been in play, but you know, companies are still implementing that and trying to figure it out. And it just, it seems to me that when you address one piece of legislation, another pops up. Robert, it just reminds me of this game of whack-a-mole. You see a regulation, you deal with it, and there's another one. Yeah, Jonathan, you, you may not even be aware, you probably aren't, that Australia is going through a big amendment process right now to overhaul and potentially upgrade their privacy law. So you're exactly right. And what we do at Catch is try to find the commonalities across these various regulations, because there are some. They're not completely different there are concepts and some details that are reused across them. And once you focus on what's universal, you can come up with a much more adaptable and responsive policy infrastructure. So you don't feel like you're reinventing the wheel or whacking a new mole each time. I got you, man. And I feel for people trying to do this, you know, in addition to that, there's this increasing awareness from consumers on how their data is used. You know, fueled by movies like The Social Dilemma, if you caught that, but also just stemming from you know, the big tech 800 pound gorillas like Google and Facebook and the lack of transparency they've shown in how they how they capture and use our data. So this is a massive wave coming. that's not just regulatory, but I think driven by consumer awareness. You know, the second area of complexity, data privacy is a team sport is what we found in, in our many implementations. It's not it's not just a legal office thing. It requires coordination across the organization. It has uh, implications for marketing, you know, it touches the user experience and it affects the consumer buyer journey and your brand voice. It affects human resources, since we could be talking about employee data. It affects information security as they work to minimize or eliminate the threat of a data breach with data security and access control policies. You know, they say that companies with high privacy accountability are less likely to suffer data breaches. And it's a, it's a key part of this. And lastly, IT and technology, because policies affect data systems and they affect web infrastructure and they, they affect all the pieces that data kind of runs through our business and the systems around it. Yeah, as you say, Jonathan, it's pervasive throughout an organization and that's because it's, it's not so much about privacy as it is about data and personal data. And that's everywhere within a modern business. A few additional comments about HR. I'm sure some of the audience have been thinking about HR from the jump which has been the right move, at least with respect to GDPR. But in California, at least, CCPA offered employers some exemptions such that they didn't really have to confront all of the obligations with respect to 
uh, data subjects who are employees, but that's changing completely with CPRA coming down the pike and employers will have to afford the same privacy rights and the same level of security for employees as they had been doing for consumers. So HR is going to come fully back onto the radar and dealing with HR data subjects can be fraught at times for all the reasons you might imagine. So that's a big one. Yeah, uh, thanks for that, Robert. And so it's not just managing people, right? It's also managing a complex data system, which is kind of the modern, modern data organization. It's complicated, right? And it's extensive. Uh, consumer data often doesn't just sit into, in your four walls. It flows across an ecosystem of partners, vendors, and service providers, each with varying methods of data capture and control, different consumer identifiers, different policies, and so on. The example you're seeing on the screen now is actually a relatively simple one. You know, it's for a small client. The data systems really start to add up. I think we have something like 25 total destinations here. And pushing data around this ecosystem and ensuring compliance and respect of consumer consent throughout all of it can get pretty unscalable pretty fast. And, and that was one of the key things we're looking to, to solve for. So how do we solve it? How, how do we solve for this complex ball of yarn, if you will, called data privacy? Uh, basically, we have to change the game. Uh, and so throw out the old tools, throw out the ways of thinking. You'll see all this on the in the demo, so I won't, I won't go too crazy on it here, but some of the things to look for. Our policy center is built so you can respond to policy changes quickly. No shirt, no shoes, no policy, no problem, right? It's, it adds on easy. Add new policies as they come up around the world, edit them when you see fit, and relax knowing policies designed by legal or other policy owners are realized throughout the complex data ecosystem. Um, our user experience for privacy notices is fully customizable in style and look and feel, in language, in timing. And so marketing loves it and they can really plug in. But one of the things that was important for us is to make sure that the system was easy to deploy. Same day, if you like, and we give you everything you need to move fast. And it's not just the initial deployment, it's deployment of any new policies that come down the pipe, any new service providers, that you want to work with. And so we built drag and drop integrations. We've got a marketplace to add service providers as, you, as your business and data ecosystem grows. We're deeply connected across that data ecosystem, which means 100% policy realization. You deploy catch once and you secure and comply everywhere. And, and this is huge. You know, most, most service providers don't have privacy APIs. So we have to build the connectors to ensure they can receive privacy signals from you and your customers and consumers. And lastly, automation. Uh, we built automation in a number of areas around the solution. I'm, I'm talking real automation that deals with consent orchestration, essentially pushing uh, customer permits around and data subject rights, which we'll talk about in a second. And when we talk about automation, we're not talking about pushing emails around your organization in some kind of automated work workflow. We're talking about actually executing data control across broad aspects of our solution. Yeah, and JJ, the point about yeah. automation is not just about making everything easier. That's a big part of it. It's about making it more secure and more reliable. The fewer humans who are interacting with these consent requests or data subject rights, the better, because humans can result in error and loss, and that's a counter to the goals of processing data privacy rights. Absolutely. Thanks for that, Robert. And you know, although we love solving tough problems, you know, we didn't do this just because it was hard and just because data, data privacy is complex. We did it so our customers can make money and so they can save money and sleep at night knowing that their privacy program is being affected in the places and systems it needs to be and so they can feel comfortable that they future-proof their business in partnering with us. There are studies out there that suggest that the ROI on privacy is something like 2.7x, but uh, you know, I must admit with Catch we're seeing far, far in excess of that. And to build on that, we've, we've built value-based value rollout plans to help, to help get people there and realize full value. So get compliant and do that easily, not just for the regulators, but for your customers who will only grow in their relationship with you with trust and transparency over the use of their data. Save money, the cost of compliance can be overwhelming. You know, privacy was unscalable. And in terms of responding to new regulations with more meetings and engineering time because of the scale and scope of data subject requests and the number and systems they touch and the hours to process each one, the compliance costs can really add up and we just wanted to basically uh, take that off the table completely. But also, you know, 
Go to privacy, I think, is an opportunity to make money. Or designing them the right way is an opportunity to make money. Data is the lifeblood of your business. Source it responsibly, put it to use in the systems that need it. Sales, marketing, data science, analytics, and, and build privacy by design capability for personalization and other revenue generating activity. You don't have to choose between compliance and data utilization. You can have your cake and eat it too. So let's get to it. Let's, let's put our money where our mouth is, Robert, and show some cool and effective software. Thanks, Jonathan. So let's look at some software. We are in the Catch platform now, and I'm showing you our policy center. The policy center is where you go to make decisions. You decide how you're gonna collect and process and organize data, usually personal data, around the world or around the country. So what you see here are probably some areas that you're used to seeing treated differently. They're highlighted for a reason. These are parts of the world that have, let's call them particular data protection or data privacy rules and regulations. We call these policy scopes. So let's click into the European policy scope. A policy scope, as I said, is where your business decides what it wants to do based on the jurisdiction, based on the regulations in that area, what it wants to do with data. So as you can see in this European policy scope, we've got the relevant regulations, GDPR and e-privacy, the regions where this applies, and the data subject rights that are applicable in this area. Now, we provide these as templates to you within the platform, but they're totally customizable for your business's needs. After all, the regulations are not the only thing that matter. Your business also has its own judgments, its own imperatives about how it wants to run and what it wants to do with data. Our policy center and the policy scopes within it make that possible for you. For example, we've populated the fulfillment times for rights over here based on legislation, but you may change those as you see fit. So that's an example of the European policy scope, and there can be others. We'll populate more of them as they become important or critical around the world. We've got Brazil, we've got Canada, we've got India. This is a partial list for our demo. Of course, we have California. Another piece of the policy center that's critical to understanding the benefits of our platform is purposes. Purposes are where you answer the question, what does my business do with data? It's pretty straightforward. You collect data and you process it for a reason. Collect it from consumers, collect it from employees, do something with it. And what permission do you have to accomplish that purpose? So again, we'll provide you with some templates, but you can add or subtract purposes however it meets your business needs, whether they're external facing, or internal facing purposes. So let's click into an example, analytics, a very common purpose. You've got some details for an overview. I'll show you where those return in a moment. And let's look at the legal basis, which is another critical step. So the legal basis is the justification that you have for performing the relevant purpose. And then you map it to the policy scope. All right, that's a lot. So let me say again, You've got these various policy scopes, which are jurisdictions that you're responding to around the world or around the country. In each one, you're gonna be performing these data processing purposes. And for each purpose, you need the right legal basis or the right permission from the consumer, the customer, the employee. So in California, for example, analytics might be disclosure based, meaning you just need to tell the consumer that you're doing it and then you're allowed to do it. But in Europe, with most purposes, you need opt-in consent. So here you can see it's opt-in consent under the European policy scope. These are really easy to change as the regulations change or your interpretations change or your business needs change. So that's the connection between policy scopes that you set in the policy center, your data processing purposes and the legal bases. Let's move to the experience server to see how all of this comes together. What I'm showing you here is a preview of what one of our experiences would look like to a website visitor or an employee or a mobile app. You see the same purposes that we established in the policy center reappearing here. And you can see that this is for 
the GDPR policy scope. So you don't have to leave the platform to see a preview of how these welcome mats, as we call them, these experiences are going to appear outside of the platform. I should point out that cookies are not irrelevant to our data processing regime and the way that we have established our platform. And I'll show you another example of how those appear in a moment. Now, if you change the policy scope to California, you see a different preview of how it's going to look. The famous do not shell, sell, excuse me, my personal information link, as well as some of the other disclosures that are gonna be required under CPRA. So let's stay within the experience server and look at how you can easily edit these welcome mats that you're putting out. If you want to change this message here, you just click on it. There's no code. There's no talking to your marketing team. There are no meetings. You get together with the relevant stakeholders in the product here, and you decide what you want to write in this box. We've got translations available, and it's all easily done through what we say, clicks not code. Furthermore, we know that purple and black may not be quite consistent with your brand posture. So we give you the ability through themes here to change colors and other design elements to suit your business. What do our customers love about what, you, what you've shown so far, Robert? The, the policy center grows with their business. So as you grow glo globally and are subject to new regulations, you can drag and drop a whole other policy scope and be immediately compliant uh, the way that you want to be. And as new regulations pop up, you know, like a whack-a-mole, you can handle it. And you can handle it through your initial catch deployment. You don't need a new module for a new uh, regulation for a new acronym. It's set with the policy center you have. Um, the other piece of it is that transparency you showed into the logic behind policy positioning, legal bases, rights, purposes, just that visibility in all the building blocks. So any policy owner can see exactly how they're complying against specific regulations is key. And then in the experiences, that customization is, is key for marketing. I, I love that you called it a welcome mat because it can be an expression of your brand voice, right? It's that, it's that critical first impression, that first step in the customer journey when they show up on your website. And you know, it doesn't have to be a legal statement. You know, it can be a brand expression, right? It can be something that expresses how important trust and transparency is uh, to brands. You're right, Jonathan, you can have fun with these experiences, these welcome mats. You don't have to engage in boring legal language as you so enjoy calling it. And you don't have to get you know, all these different teams together uh, who have special technical skill to be the, build those experiences. You just do it within the product and it's totally intuitive to customize. So to that end, we've moved out of the platform now to a real website. So this is a hypothetical business called Axonic. And imagine that this is a European business. So we're within the GDPR European policy scope right now. And we're showing you what one of these experiences would look like. So again, you see these purposes that we've talked about and you see the legal basis represented by the fact that there's a slider here to opt in or opt out. And as I mentioned, cookies are relevant, but they're not the be all end all. They're not the definitive characteristic of data privacy. They're just a mechanism for data processing purposes. So we associate them with purposes, but again, they're not the primary driver of the disclosures that you're making to your data subjects or your employees. Purposes are so much more intelligible for someone who wants to understand what you're doing with their data rather than cookies. But the disclosures are here. And we also have category disclosures, which are relevant in particular under laws like CPRA, what kind of categories of data are you using or collecting? What's the retention period? Are they sold or shared? Now, let's talk about web infrastructure for a moment. Web infrastructure is the category of elements that fire, as they say, on a web page or a mobile app. Fire meaning they are the technology that operates in the background, whether it's cookies or JavaScript or tags. They start the collection of personal data and then it goes off into the you know, never, never land ecosystem of data processing. It's a huge area of non-compliance for many websites and apps. What I mean by that is all of that technology is firing before users or data subjects have given their consent. 
it's obvious, but it's, it's worth repeating perhaps. Why are you asking for consent if you fire all that infrastructure before you get the consent? Regulators are starting to take a much closer look at this sort of gap. What I mean here is that if you look at a browser extension like Tag Explorer here, you can see only essential infrastructure is firing on this page right now. So Google Tag Manager, Google Web Font. This is as it should be. These are fundamental to displaying and operating the, the website, the internet, if you will. Only after I consent to all of these purposes do the non-essential, so-called non-essential tags and technologies begin to fire. So you see now Google Analytics, now LinkedIn, now Marketo can collect personal data and then take it off to do what they're going to do with it on behalf of Axonic. Remember the business is, is what we refer to as a controller here. So this raises a different issue. Okay, we've got tag control through web infrastructure with catch. We've got that figured out, but that data now has been shipped off to these third parties for them to perform the purposes on behalf of Axonic. How do we make sure that we are, we Axonic are still able to control the data once it has escaped, if you will, to these third parties. The law requires you to maintain control of the data as privacy choices change, even when it's in these downstream systems. So how do we handle that? Well, it's gonna look like this. This is Marketo, which is a marketing automation provider that in our hypothetical, Axonic is using for marketing automation. And as you can see, Robert Cunningham is opted in to these various purposes within Marketo. But what happens when Robert wants to change his mind? Well, Robert's gonna go back to Axonic, return to the preferences and say, I changed my mind. I am opting out of these various purposes. I no longer want them to be processed against my personal data. And Robert saves that. Now, if we refresh the page, you can see that one thing has happened properly in that the non-essential tags are no longer fired. So Robert, the, the use case here, someone jumps on, maybe comes to your website for the first time, hasn't given consent, the tags don't fire. They come back, they, they offer their consent, the tags fire and data collection starts to happen. And then they come back, you know, maybe hours, maybe days, maybe weeks later, and they revoke some kind of consent. Um, and then, all right, the tags don't fire on the page, but what happens to the data already collected in Marketo? They're not supposed to process that, right? Like, That's right. So let's see, let's go back into Marketo and let's refresh the page. There it is. Boom. As you can see down here, all of those purposes that were previously opted in have been opted out. So Jonathan, as you described, I, Robert Cunningham, went back to Exonic. I changed my mind and automatically across those systems, I was opted out of Marketo so that Axonic is not gonna have to worry about Marketo continuing to do marketing automation against Robert. Now, what does that look like in the platform? I'm back inside Catch, okay? And I'm in the orchestration section and I'm looking at the various systems that you can choose from as a customer to add to your platform. And in this case, we're using Marketo as described earlier. So I've gone in as a user and I've selected Marketo and said, hey, I wanna, I wanna integrate with Marketo. Catch makes all of that available for you seamlessly so that this sort of automatic orchestration can take place. It's a really complicated thing, Jonathan. Yeah, Robert, it's, it's, I mean, it's a complicated thing to get that configuration that docking with Marketo, but we wanted to make this as easy as we can for our customers. And so one of the ways we do that is just to have a drag and drop marketplace uh, like you're seeing here, you basically pick, you know, one of the dozens of vendors, service providers you may have that you wish to uh, send signals to uh, or execute rights against, which we'll, which we'll talk about in a second. And although it looks incredibly simple here, there's a lot of complexity that, that we've solved for behind the scenes. Primarily, there isn't a lot of privacy APIs out there. So this ability to speak to some of these marketing and sales systems and speak that privacy language 
hey, my purpose is analytics. Hey, my purpose is targeted advertising. I now need you to turn that off because I don't have consent. That translation layer, we basically had to materialize in our integrations with these systems. So that that comes with it as you as you click down on each one of these. And it was a big, big, uh, hairy problem that we solved. So what you're saying, Jonathan, is that there might be another element to this orchestration, which is rights. And this might even be the more famous part of it. Data subject rights are the things like, I want you to erase my data. I want you to port my data to another system. I want you to correct my data. I want you to show me what data you've collected. We handle this through rights orchestration. Now, let's imagine that Axonic uses HubSpot for CRM. We are now within HubSpot and we're looking at the contact record for my colleague, Jonathan Joseph. And let's say that Jonathan has decided that he wants to exercise his right under GDPR to erasure, meaning delete my data. Well, that request goes to Axonic, right? Axonic is the controller. They're the entity with whom Jonathan's interacting. They're getting the benefit of his data and he's gonna go there to exercise his right to deletion. Now, Catch provides the preferences that you've already seen around purposes where you lodge your consent or withdraw it. We also provide the data rights intake forms. So at this point, Jonathan's gonna exercise his right to erasure. And he's gonna say, I'm Jonathan at catch.com. Where's Jonathan? Let's say he's in Albania. Please get me out of here. Okay, Jonathan, let's submit that. Where does that go? Let's go back into the platform to see what's happening. This is the orchestration section, a different orchestration section within the platform. And this is a workflow. A workflow is a recipe basically for how you want your system and your third party systems to respond to a particular data subject right. So let me just pause to unpack that a little bit. There are lots of different types of data subject rights. In this case, we're demonstrating a deletion right. There only needs to be one workflow for each type of right. And then customers drag all of the various systems they use onto this canvas to make sure that those systems respond automatically to the data deletion request. So in this case, Axonic is using Catch to manage HubSpot and Google and Salesforce and Adobe, managing how they respond to data deletion requests. As those requests come in, they will be subjected to this workflow. They will move through this workflow through software, through automation, not manually. And the deletion will be accomplished in these various systems. Okay. This is the rights queue within orchestration. This is where you collect all of the incoming requests. So as I recall, Jonathan logged his request as a right to erasure under GDPR. And down at the bottom here, we have the most recent right to erasure. And here it is, Jonathan Joseph, who, as you'll recall, in his uh, urgent fashion said, please get me out of here. This workflow was kicked off when Jonathan logged, lodged that request. And you can see it's been successful through all of these various systems, including HubSpot. And we take a look here and a vid, which is how HubSpot responds and recognizes these contact records. This vid 701 has been deleted. Well, says you catch, but let's check HubSpot. Refresh the page. Oh, Jonathan, I'm so sorry. You are gone. <laughs> well, my data's gone, but I'm not gone. And by the way, Robert, uh, thank you for using me as an example there. I, I hear Albania is nice this time of year. Yes, um, you're welcome. It was <laughs> it was hard to ignore. No, so this is this is a high value item. Um, the 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 number of data subject requests you get can get can number in the hundreds for some of our clients and thousands even, and there can be some complexity and scale there. So for example, you know, even relatively small clients have a lot of data systems they work with, um, you know, not uncommon to see 12 to 20 of those. And so 
if you get a data deletion request, you need to delete it from each one, uh, which sometimes if you're doing that manually includes calling the stakeholder who happens to own that system, someone in sales and marketing perhaps, and kind of putting aside, you know, the somebody looking through personal data so they can delete it. And obviously you don't want that. Um, it's pretty costly to try to delete these manually and not uncommon to see it, you know, three to five hours per request. And so to automate it like this saves a lot of time and money. And I will say it's a it's pretty new, new concept for the market. Um, you might see workflow tools, you might see canvases like the one Robert showed, but what they're really doing is pushing emails around and kind of automating workflow and automating requests, but they're not doing the actual deletion. Um, and it's, it's another example of where we've built some next gen capability and, and changing the game in privacy. And Jonathan, another thing that's operating here is that the regulations and the regulators are catching up with this. The first iteration of some of these laws like CCPA were a little bit vague on the allocation of responsibilities between what they refer to as businesses and service providers. And so um, some, of the, some of the players in the space thought, well, look, the data left my systems. It's not my responsibility anymore. CPRA um, and other regulations have cleaned up that gap and said, no, 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 you misunderstand. You are always responsible for managing the data and controlling it. Just because you choose to use some third party system doesn't mean that you've shifted or uh, abrogated that responsibility. So there's a, a closer look being taken at this sort of thing. Let me, let me turn it back over to you, Jonathan, to take us through a summary of where we've been. We've shown a lot and we wanna make sure that it has sunk in as much as possible. So Jonathan, if you'll take it back over. All right. Hey, thanks, Robert. I think uh, I need to go look for a mic so so you can drop it. Um, so let's 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 we'll take some questions in a second. Uh, but let, let's recap our greatest hits, if you will. Uh, not in our voice, but actually in the voice of our customers. And all, all of these are available on on G two if you want to check them out, uh, as well as some others. You know, for Patreon, we talked about the Policy Center. For Patreon, we're giving them the comfort to scale their fast growing business. And, and I love this quote from general counsel over there. We can go anywhere in the world with Catch. Uh, our experiences give Chubbies the flexibility to express their brand uh, over to web infrastructure at Colony is a sophisticated, sophisticated ad tech business. And we control web infrastructure for them and ensure it respects consumer consent. It's designed to do exactly what's needed. And that means a lot coming from sophisticated techies like them. We talked about the huge cost of compliance for things like data subject right requests and at Smartsheet, our rights orchestration is saving hundreds of thousands in compliance costs. And those savings are growing with a huge growth in DSR volume we're seeing. Uh, I saved the one in the middle for the end because uh, I love it. It just sums it all up there in the center with Selena Finance. A simple solution for a complex world. That's, that's exactly where we want to be. Um, hey, Lindsay, if there, if there are any questions, I uh, would, would love to take some. Excellent. Well, thank you guys so much. What a cool technology. And we did get a couple questions. Um, just to kick it off, what's the difference between Catch's API Marketplace versus OneTrust's API Marketplace? Ah, I can take that one, Robert. Um, and look, I, I don't want to dig in on OneTrust necessarily, right? But but what I will say generally is kind of what we pointed out to what we pointed out in the demo. When we connect apps and service providers to, to your instance of catch, we're actually doing the deletion. We're actually fulfilling the subject right, requ right request. What you see sometimes is if you see a similar app marketplace, they may be just connecting that uh, vendor or that service provider into the workflow. And the workflow may still be pushing emails around. And that's an, that's an important question uh, to ask, right? Are you actually, actually fulfilling the task, are actually doing what needs to happen? Or are you just triggering an email for me to go into that system and you know do the thing? And that, that would be the key thing I'd watch out for there, Lindsay. Excellent. Okay. And another one that came in, do the data subject rights work for SAP systems or employee systems like Workday too, or data you've received by paper and entered into a system? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, we uh, we are 
I guess agnostic might be the right word, but the technology is is can accommodate and is agnostic toward those different media and those different systems. To us, they're just a different API problem to solve or whichever other avenue is the best one to sort that out. But we can deal with an upload of legacy data. Uh, we can deal with different types of systems, internal or external. Uh, it's, it's a reapplication of some of the same principles that we have honed in our work so far. Great, thank you guys. Another one, um, pending regulations will require new policies around this person's privacy program. How does Catch's Policy Center make these changes easier? Yeah, that's a, a fair question. We, we say it's easier. And the best way that we've come up with to communicate that is to show it to you. So I hope that the demo made that as clear as, as it can be. But let me add to that. I think I said at the outset that there's a lot of commonality across these regulations. So things like legal bases and things like purposes and even the definitions of personal data have more in common actually than they, than they don't. And so our goal has been to suss out those commonalities and put them into the policy center so that when you are responding to various regulations, you can use things that are shared, use elements that are shared across them. Purposes is another great example. It's not about the cookies or the JavaScript. It's about your company's, your organization's data processing purposes that you are presumably going to repeat across the various states and countries. And you might have a different legal basis but the idea of a purpose and the idea of a legal basis is consistent across those jurisdictions. So it's a little bit hard to convey in words, but it's a well thought out way to approach these regulations through their common elements rather than treating them like uh, a different starting place each time. Excellent. And uh, another question that's, that's related to that, Robert, um, Somebody said, I've been told cookie collection is all that's needed for consent. Why would I base my privacy program off of purposes? Lots to unpack there. <laughs> yeah, well, until, until now, you probably didn't have an option to base your privacy program off anything other than cookies, but now you know there's a, a better way. So cookies do require consent, and they have since at least 2009 private probably under the e-privacy directive or the so-called cookie law in Europe but subsequent regulations aren't about cookies they're not about the how they're about the what are you collecting my data to perform targeted advertising cookies are just a way to kick off that process but they're not the so-called subsequent purpose so yes you probably need permission for the cookies but what you really need permission for is the data processing the act that you're going to perform with that data. Why did you collect it? To do what with it? And what permission do you have? So that's why we go through purposes and we think, the well, we know the regulations are moving in that direction. And it's also a much stronger and more robust way to manage data governance principles. Cookies are just talking about what's happening on your website. And maybe you throw in SDKs to talk about applications. Purposes are a way to manage data across all of your systems, whether you're talking about internal or external, consumers or employees. Again, it's an example of our figuring out what's common and what can be a powerful unifying element rather than focusing on something as, as specific as a cookie. Excellent, thank you. Um, another question, how does the catch system support verification of data subjects and consumers? I'm happy to take that if that's all right with folks. Um, so basically, it, it, it depends on the type of data subject for us. We work with various third parties um, who provide various identif identity verification services. Um, if you want to go to a more strenuous verification uh, procedure, and that's just a tile that you can add in the workflow. Uh, but we also support um, less extreme versions of proving you have custody of the email address, for example, that you invoked the right against. Um, so you can basically pick the level that you uh, think meets the, the needs based on the type of data that is being uh, managed in your particular application. Does the, does, the person, does the person who just answered that question care to share the authority with which he answered that question? 
<laughs> my, my apologies. My name is Max Anderson. I'm the head of product here at Catch. Thank you all for joining. So you all are hearing it directly from the source. Uh, let's see, we've got a couple more. Uh, I understand consent is required for data collection in certain jurisdictions, but I'm terrified with how this could impact marketing performance. The chances of a regulator coming after my business seem slim. Do I really need to offer visitors consent choices? Should we have the lawyer answer that? Uh, yeah, I, I'll try to, I'll, I'll wear as many hats as I can in answering that. So look, if your business has currently been uh, flouting all of the relevant regulations, and I, I don't mean to impugn your business, I'm sure it isn't. If you're going from doing nothing to doing something, might your data funnel narrow a bit? Yes, it would be disingenuous to, to claim that's not true. But if you're looking at the world of compliance on a spectrum, then the answer is to implement the best processes so that you present a trusted experience to your consumers or to your employees and that you exercise granular, we would argue purpose-based control over that data. So again, is your question a, an entirely legitimate one? And I, and I say that not patronizingly, yes, it is. But if you were trying to figure out the best way to comply, accepting that compliance is an imperative, then purposes are a stronger way to do that. And you can maintain useful, a useful funnel of data for marketing or targeted advertising or whatever it might be by developing better UX, better internal control, more seamless integrations with your existing systems. There's a better way to do it that, that does contemplate the fact that it must be done. You cannot ignore that these regulators are starting to focus on things. And they are, you know, whether it's France, whether it's Ireland, they're tar starting to take a look at that web infrastructure I showed you. California has a, many millions of dollars devoted to this now with an independent agency. So if putting your head in the sand and hoping that the risk was small was ever a viable solution, which it might've been for a while, I think that time has passed. And thanks, Robert. Uh what does it mean if I don't actually connect consent signals to my data systems? Is that, I'm assuming that's like a, a, a legal question? Like if I don't do it, or is it, yeah. So it means you're not completing the legally required job is what it means. Uh, and it's a hard thing to do. You can, you can attempt to manage data within your four walls, acknowledging that those walls are virtual to begin with, so it's not as easy as it sounds. But if you're going to take advantage of third-party vendors, and everybody does, and with good reason, all the way from the AWSs of the world to something very, very specific, if you're going to take advantage of those, then <laughs> with great utility comes great responsibility. You have to, to make sure that you can control privacy signals up and down and around your data ecosystem. So to put it simply, what happens if you don't do it is you're not compliant with the laws. And, and in reality, what might happen is if you use an email marketing provider, for example, one of your data subjects opts out and you think that you did something internally to make sure they don't get emails anymore, but you forgot to tell your provider and they're still emailing that person, they get the email and they're angry. And then they go to a regulator or they go on you know, Yelp or they get an article written about it and then your PR suffers. So let's put the legal risk aside for a moment and think about the brand awareness and the brand image damage that can be done for those sorts of failures. Excellent. Um, and it looks like this might be our last question, so keep submitting them, guys, if uh, if you haven't had a chance yet. But uh, And it's a funny one to, to possibly end on. How much do you guys cost? Oh man, I, well, I, I love that someone just got straight to the point there. Um, it's not about how much we cost, you know, it's, it's about how much value we're, we're going to drive, I think. But but also, I mean, on the cost side, we have pretty simple pricing that's available on the website. We, um, our approach there, just to kind of unpack that a little bit, when you buy the policy center, all the things that you saw kind of Robert dem demo there, you get the policy center, which means as new regulations come online across the world, you're already set. We're not going to charge you uh, for new modules that you add on, which is common out there. Um, and the ROI is there, so that's probably the lens through which to look at it. But but having said that, I think one of the ways I would summarize what we do here is basically Tony Robbins results uh, at TJ Maxx prices. 
Wow. <laughs> I like that picture. Wow. <laughs> right? Um, well, thank you guys for, for, for joining us here on the webinar. I really, really enjoyed doing it. And um, seeing you do that demo, Robert, was awesome. And, and I really appreciate the folks that jumped online here today. Excellent. Thank you guys very much. Thanks, everyone. Right. Thanks, everyone.